just gonna get the thermostat. Oh, okay. Not in the room. In the middle. Tap it off.
Well, good morning. Let me ask you to stand as, as we sing praises this morning to welcome the church, but also those that are online. We're going to sing, How Great is Our God. The splendor of the king that we have in our lives to look out for us in times of rain and the joy that we have. So sing with us, How Great is Our God. The splendor of the king Lord in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, oh, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. start worship, isn't it? My Amen. goodness, it, it, look at around you. It sounded like there was 2,000 people in this room singing praise. Y'all's voices <laughs> are that good. Okay, I'm telling you. Well, welcome to our homecoming service. You know, I really, I, I had faith that we would be out there. I knew y'all wouldn't mind being out in the rain and getting wet for Jesus. You know, the downpour, this, all that stuff. But you know what? Uh, uh, better heads prevailed, but we're glad that we're able to worship, and you know, even though the weather didn't cooperate uh, with us, and we're having a few um, issues with the piping and the the, um, the gas line on the parking lot, we wish that would have been done by now. You know what? None of this is a surprise to God, and you know, it just reminds us that our dependence is upon Him, and we come to worship Him when we gather together in Jesus' name. So welcome to our homecoming service. It's good to see a lot of folks in here with us today. And I know we've got folks in the fellowship hall in our overflow, and we've got folks on Facebook Live watching us. So welcome. Thank you for tuning in. You are in for a great treat today. I want to remind you that our homecoming offering is going to be used 100% for missions. Okay, 100% for missions. In, in our bulletin, it has the breakdown of those, but I do want to remind you that we're going to help with uh, $10 seed packets for, for you to take and do ministry local. We're going to help Pastor Quintel Hill and the Multiply Church in Monroe, and he's really excited about, about us helping him and partnering with him. We're grateful to see a video 
from Pastor Quintel last week. We're going to help him. We're going to help a dear brother of mine, Pastor Charlie Brown in East Baltimore Graffiti Church. And I do ask that you pray for him and Diane. Um, their son passed away a week ago unexpectedly. And so we just send our prayers and thoughts to Pastor Charlie Brown and Diane during this time of loss. He leaves behind a wife and, and two daughters. Um, so we just pray for them, but we're going to help them. And then we're also going to help the Central Asia Sawgrass Farm and uh, with the way that God is using that to um, filter water, but also open doors for the gospel. So that offering today before you leave, if you haven't come forward and put your offering, make sure you come and do that. Put that in there, and all that's going to go to missions. I do remind you that we do have a blood drive coming up on November 7th. We need folks to register for that event, okay? Please give blood. There is a great, great need for blood donations. All those that are able to give are going to receive a $10 gift card from the Blood Connection. You go to our church website. Right there, there's a WCBC blood donation link. Click that, and it's easy to register. We want folks to give blood. Our goal is 27 units of blood. So please spread the word, and let's get that taken care of. Okay. I do also want to mention to you that next week we will start our, we will relaunch our pre-COVID schedule. Okay. Now you can come at 10 o'clock and you'll be either very early for the second service or very late for small groups. Either way, we want to encourage you to be here at 830. We're going to have our 830 service. Now, mind you, that masks will be required for that service. Okay. You, if you're here, you have to have a mask on for that service. After that service, we do have small groups available for our children, our youth, and adults. And if you need assistance finding a class, we will, we will do that. But we're going to slowly relaunch some of our classes, and that will be after the 830 service. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll have a service again, and uh, masks are optional for that, kind of like this service right now. Masks are optional. So pick the service that best fits what, what, what's comfortable for you and your family, and we want to minister to you. Well, today we are very blessed very blessed. We have Pastor Hiro and his wife Gloria are here with us today, and we've got his sons up here helping lead and worship and some folks from their church here. Um, they are um, a wonderful church plant that, that partners with us. We partner with them. They use our facilities on Sunday afternoons for their church, and, and because it's homecoming and they're part of our church family and our community, we felt it was important to have them here as well, so we welcome you, and Pastor Hiro is going to come and share a little testimony about what God is doing in his life and in the life of that church plant and share with us ways that we can pray for them and then he's going to lead us in a time of prayer and then we're going to have Dr. Gary Miller um, come and lead us in uh, preaching of God's word. Dr. Gary and his beautiful wife Dana are dear friends of ours. How many of y'all were here last fall when Gary and Dana came on a Wednesday night and shared with us. What a, what a wonderful couple. Um, I won't steal uh, his thunder, but um, uh, God has done a great work in his life over the past six months, and, and we just praise God for that. He is from Texas. We love him anyways, but um, um, they don't have barbecue down there. I don't know what it is they eat, but, but, but no. Um, they, they, came all, they come all the way from Texas, and they have been partnering with churches in North Carolina, just helping uh, mobilize churches and God's people to stand up for biblical principles, but also just say, listen, now's the time for God's people to rise up and make their voices be heard. They, uh, Dr. Gary has written a book called Pray or Talk Less, Pray More. Okay, and this is a, a very uh, phenomenal book. We actually have a copy of this in our library we bought. Um, but Dana will be just outside the library. If you want to come and talk with them, they have copies of this available. It's a very, very good book. It's a very good resource, and it's very encouraging. So I hope you get a chance to go by and see them and talk with them afterwards. So we're really excited about what God is doing today. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And then we're going to go back to um, uh, our praise and worship through song. And at the appointed time, we're going to ask Pastor Hiro to come up and share. And then we'll ask Brother Gary and his wife to come and share as well. Father, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. 
Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And Father, we are thankful that we can gather as your people in your house, united under the cross of Jesus Christ, to sing praises to you, to give our hearts in worship to you, and to receive the word that you have for us, the powerful word of God. And Father, we pray for this offering, even now, that as we are receiving it, that it will be multiplied greatly in your hands as we disperse this this offering all around the world in the name of Jesus. And may every dollar be given to you, multiplied in your hands, and may we see a great harvest as a result of the faithfulness of your people. And Lord, we do pray for um, Pastor Hiro as he shares. We pray for Brother Gary as he shares, and Dana as she shares a little bit about what God's doing in their lives. And Father, we, we just thank you for servants of God that have given themselves faithfully to your work. And now may we continue in our praise unto you, for you are worthy of all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me ask you to stand again and sing, In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This corn is strong, this solid ground. Firm to the fiercest drought that's gone. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh. Fullness of God in helpless pain. This gift of love. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till all that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no steam of man, can ever pluck me from his hand, till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no steam of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say. 
God that loves you as you are. You are so wonderful to him. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's good to be in the Lord's house, amen? amen. Especially when we get it together in one spirit to worship Him. It is amazing to be here with all of you. I'm so grateful to be here, and I'm very pleased to be with me, some members of my congregation, my family, and all of you. Thank you for allowing us to be here and be part of this a wonderful ministry and I give you thanks to the Lord for the pastor here for the leaders for the deacons for the members we really feel at home here we really feel like uh, we part of this family since uh, uh, 2014 uh, the end of the year 2014 around this this time we start uh, getting together with Spanish uh, churches here, put things together for establish a, a Spanish ministry in this congregation. By that time, Pastor Keith Fulbright is a, was a pastor of the church, so he, with his leadership, opened the door for us to start a, a ministry to reach all the Hispanic congregation around the area uh, in Sebulon. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased for that, and uh, since that time, we've been growing, we've been ministry, we've been rich people for the Lord, we've been baptized people, a lot of decision of faith, we do all the ministries we can, and we become a part of the uh, Anglo Church with Wayfield Central Baptist Church. Uh, as a one ministry, do things together, like events, music, uh, fellowship, uh, missions. So there's so many things to give you thanks to the Lord for this uh, church, uh, for all the support that we have around here, for all the opportunities as well. So we feel very, very pleased to be a part of this ministry, and I hope they continue to do this work. I'm a church planter for the Baptist State Convention in the central area, central east area of the state. So I not work here only, I'm a pastor here for the Spanish church, but I'm, I'm coaching other pastors, and I'm, I do some conference and, and, and leadership coaching and help other uh, new uh, members, new pastors to spread it out. So say this is that my heart is so uh, pleased and so rejoiced for, for all of you. This is a family that I, I can um, have better chores to continue do the ministry. So I really give you thanks for all of you. And even though we had this situation of the virus, but still we moving on because God is in control, you know. And we, we need to just find ways to do the ministry even through these circumstances. I know it's hard, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. So thanks again for allowing us to be part of the uh, church, for using the, all the facility, for have all the resources available for us, and for have the bless of the Lord here. So I would like for you, if you please stand up, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna lead a, a special prayer, and we're gonna give it welcome to Pastor Gary so he can preach the word, and through the spirit can Store our hearts and continue to move. Let's pray. 
Praise your Holy Father. We are gathered together this morning with only one field. Like your presence is in us and is with us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here today. We can get better place. We can have better circumstances that, that we gather together just to worship you, to honor you, to have your word that encourages us to continue. We know that we are living in the last times. We know that you are coming soon, Lord. But help us to continue, prepare ourselves, prepare others and reach others that they don't know you, Father. Thank you for the heart of this church, for the heart of the pastor about the missions. Thank you, Lord, for opening the door for anybody that wants to come here, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Gary that he's going to preach the word in this morning, Father, that you get the message, the message that we need to hear from you, Father, that is to our hearts, that motivate us and continue help us to grow and moving on, even through all the difficulties and situations that we face around the world today. Father, we ask it that you be with us. It's in the name of the holy name, in the name of Jesus, we holy pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a seat, Pastor Garrison. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that word of prayer. Um, I'm going to try to say gracias, Romano. Did I say that correctly? Um, I've, I've, just, I've just completely exhausted all of my Spanish, but I just want you to know I do appreciate that. Um, I spent two years working in East Africa, and, and the language uh, that was uh, primary there was uh, Kinakusa and then also Kiswahili. And I never really became bilingual because I couldn't pray uh, in Swahili without me thinking of it in English first and then you know you're praying it up here before it gets out here and I'm not sure it ever came out of here <laughs> and uh, when I hear someone pray in a language that it is had to be learned I, I really respect that because your voice is familiar in heaven in any language so I appreciate that brother uh, so very much and um, I want to take just a moment, let Dana give you an intro. She, you'll find out very soon. She's the real Christian in the family. And so uh, in, um, probably in July of uh, 2010, we began a ministry. I'd pastored for 40 years. And uh, in, you think of that in terms of dog years, and you can figure out how old I am. And uh, so the uh, challenge that was before us is to uh, lay in front of people what your pastor shared just a few moments ago. Uh, how people should talk less and pray more because we'd gone through a journey with cancer, breast cancer for her and, um, and, and through that experience we realized we had, we had really uh, exhausted our vocabulary talking about cancer and as God began to take us through that journey we realized we just needed somehow just a time out, stop and begin to pray. And somehow, in the midst of all that, God would make sense out of the senseless and put hope in the midst of the hopelessness that really seemed to be encountering us. And so I don't want to take too much of our time. Dana, kind of share what we learned through that, and that will kind of set the stage for where we're going this morning. I think I shared my testimony with you the last time, but I'm just going to give you a little bit. In 2008, as he said, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And when we walked into my oncologist's office, a godly Christian man <clears throat> he held up his hand and he said, okay, here's how we're going to fight cancer. And he said with his thumb, prayer, positive attitude, diet, nutrition, exercise, and then the last would be the, the chemo, the surgery, the science, all that goes with it. But do you see that? The thumb, he said, prayer. Our thumb is our linchpin. How can we hold on to anything without our thumb? And that's the, what prayer is in our lives. We need prayer to be able to hold on to life and get through all that goes on in this world and what God wants to do through us while Satan is trying to take us out. So just, Gary's going to follow up on that, but just remember, prayer, that's the linchpin of your life, just like your thumb is the linchpin of holding on to anything. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Holy Father, again, we just bow before you. 
You're our rock, our shield, our refuge, our strength. You are King of kings, Lord of lords. You are Almighty God. <clears throat> Father, we just bow before you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this church, for Brandon and Gina. And Father, just all that they are doing here, the ministry for our people that will follow them. And Father, I just pray that you will anoint Gary, pour out your Holy Spirit upon ears and hearts to hear your word. And Father, may we be open for what you want to do in our lives as you use us in this world. And we promise to give you the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you help her down? I just want to make sure I don't lose the one that means the most to me. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it, Pastor. Listen, uh, let's look together this morning in Luke uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 1. And uh, I'm going to walk you through this version of the Lord's Prayer that you find in Luke. Most of us are familiar, uh, much more so perhaps, with the one found in Matthew. But uh, this is no less inspired by the Word of God here in Luke's writings in, go in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11 and beginning in verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. It, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. When my dad was uh, nearing death's door. I asked him, what's the most profound statement you've ever heard on prayer in, in your whole life? Dad had a prayer ministry for over 30 years. And as he shared that ministry in a thousand different churches in America and on at least six different continents around the world, uh, he, had, he knew a lot about prayer. And he had learned a great deal and taught a great deal about prayer. And these words came out of his mouth, Lord Teach us to pray. And so when I read this verse of Scripture, I can't help but think about my dad, but I also think about how simple this statement is and how profound it would be if we would learn to pray. I want you to listen to what Dana said in light of this verse of Scripture because remember her oncologist said, here's how we're going to fight cancer, and he held up a thumb. And, and I, was, I was very much overwhelmed by the news that my wife had cancer. I, Dana called cancer her great adventure, and I never really got there. Uh, I, 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 I just didn't. And that's why I say she's the real Christian in the family, because I, I was angry at God. I said things to God that I can't share with you, and, uh, and, and God doesn't throw up in my face uh, you know, when I come to him. Um, he's a gracious God, just, just remember that. And so what I share with you this morning is a journey because when we were in that fellow's room and he held up his thumb, it's, it's like the, the, the clarity of all this began to you know, come together for me that, that many times, no matter what the crisis may be, and, and I, I, God forbid any of you ever face cancer, but there are other crises, are there not? I mean, we've had uh, COVID, 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 get the picture. I mean, we've had that just you know, completely overwhelm us and saturate us over the last several months. And if you haven't heard that and you've not tuned in to that election, 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 get the picture. I mean, we're just completely, you know, can get saturated by all kinds of things that, that cause us to lose our joy uh, that, that God really wants us to have in spite of a crisis. And I didn't have it. But when I saw this, I began to think in terms, as she shared with you, that this is how we get a grip on it. Look at this for just a moment. This is a, this is a poor man's PowerPoint. Are you with, with me? Just look at it. You want to make sure you take this home with you. All right? Not my hand, but yours. Everybody kind of give me one of these. Now, listen, I know it's a Baptist church and raising your hand in something you're usually doing unless you're voting on something. But just do this for me. You know, think, okay, Lord, teach us to pray. Ready? Lord, teach us to what? Hold up your thumb. There you go. Pray. When your pastor's preaching from now on, every, whenever he's, you know, in the middle of that, just give him one of these, would you? Just give him one of these because, you know, don't ever do this, really. Seriously, don't ever do that. <laughs> He'll get your email later. But, but am I right about that? You know, I made the mistake of this morning of, of, uh, 
of, of checking my text uh, this morning about 4 a.m. Uh, who's up at 3 a.m. to make sure they send me hate mail? I, I mean, seriously. Uh, you know, I, I thought, man, I'm getting my heart ready to you know, preach and to share. Really? You know, that, that, that's commitment. You know, that's just commitment. They ought to be committed. But anyway, but look, look how this begins to unfold for us here. And the scripture says, and it happened that while Jesus was praying at a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples came to him. Now, it happened. Uh, don't, don't skip over that. It happened. Uh, listen, when Jesus prayed, things happen. When you pray, things happen. There was a fellow I came across years ago, the Archbishop of, uh, of Canterbury, William Temple. Now, he passed away in 1944, so you're not going to you know, run into him you know, anytime soon. But he had a, a way of looking at prayer. He said, when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't pray, they don't happen. I believe that old boy had a picture of what prayer is really all about. It, it happened. These things happen when Jesus prayed. Listen, are you aware Jesus is praying for you right now? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he lives to make intercession for you. That's his assignment now. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and he prays for you by name. I always get a little nervous about people who tell me, I, I just don't have a heart for prayer. Now, they're in the church all the time. They have a heart for softball. Uh, they have a heart for you know, bowling for blessings or jogging for Jesus or ceramics for Christ or you know, quilting for the Master or what, whatever the canasta for the Master is often, I'd say. But, but, but you know, they've got a heart for everything in the church except prayer. And I don't understand that because you know, when you ask Jesus in your heart, he brings himself. And guess what Jesus does? <laughs> this isn't a trick question. He prays. And so he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he's praying for you. And so what I encourage you to understand that, that prayer is something that is dynamic. And, and when you pray for your spouse and for your children and your pastor and your church and your city and your country and, and for all those who are in authority as we are challenged to pray for in 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 2. Pray for all those who are in authority. Then, then things happen. Now, I, I challenged my people to take this seriously when uh, President Obama was elected. I was pastoring. It was my last pastorate. And um, I, you know, thought, well, this is something we ought to take to, to heart. We need to pray for this man as he's been elected. I didn't vote for him. Um, I, you know, full disclosure here. I didn't. But that didn't mean I shouldn't pray for him. The Word of God tells me to pray for how many in authority? Some, maybe, my party. Mm, no, so, no, it prayed for all those who are in authority. And so we did that on a Wednesday night, handed out some cards. We're going to send these to the White House and let them know we're praying for it. These aren't congratulatory cards. These aren't, you know, your chance to make a snarky comment to him. You're going to pray for him, his wife, uh, and his children, and just let them know that you're going to take seriously the Word of God to be obedient to pray for all those who are in authority. Guess how many cards I got turned in? That's a zero in Texas. We did next week. And they stiff farmed me again. I did this, and I said, fire me or follow me, but you're going to do this. So I got fired. So I, I just say to you that, <laughs> hey, thank God and Greyhound, I'm gone. All right, but... but you know, some churches really look better in your rearview mirror. I'll, I'll tell you that, that for true. It didn't happen right away, but, but, but you know, it kind of started the ball rolling because, because, you know, there are just some people, they're not going to do this. If it hair lips the governor, they're not going to do it. That's called rebellion, folks. And so I just simply say to you, come what may in this election, you better pray for all who are in authority, even after they're elected. Perhaps that's even more important, is it not? Because that's where they get God's direction and God's correction. And if you read your Bible, you'll find God has a way of correcting just about anybody that he places in authority. You know, I, I, I got a kick last night listening to Bama fans on Twitter. I, I've got buddies of mine. I, I started to text them, you know, you ought to be praying and preparing to preach because they're just panicking you know because because finally a team shows up that's playing them you know right down to the, the finish and listen if they don't beat a team by 15 points they're just panic i mean they're just i mean they're panic and these guys are just panicking all over twitter 
And, and, I, and I wrote this, I saved all this for this morning. I, I wrote to a couple of my buddies and I said, you know, you, you Bama fans remind me of what the church is like in, in the state of the church today because, you, you know, it's all under control. It all ends well. We know that, don't we? Now, it looks like some, a crisis, but it's not really a crisis because if God's sovereign, it's all going to end well. The best is yet to come. I just simply think sometimes, you know, wouldn't we rather choose to pray than panic? Because the world is watching you do one or the other. I just ask you to understand that Jesus was praying, and, and, and while he was praying, one of his disciples came up to him in that place and said, well, would, you, would you teach us to pray? Lord, teach us to pray. Now, I love this because it only takes one. Now, you may be the only person that has a heart for prayer you know, within the sound of my voice, but it only takes one for Jesus to answer that prayer. And what, what comes out of Jesus to that one disciple's burning heart for an answer is the Lord's Prayer that has graced the hearts and lives of millions of people ever since. It never helped me win a football game, you know, kneeling and saying this, you know, on a, a dirty locker room floor. You know, I grew up in New York, so, you know, it, you know, what do we know about football anyway? But, but, the, but the point is that this was meant as an answer to someone's request. Just one person, and that's all it takes. One person. Listen, when you pray, you and God make a majority. And so the beauty here is that they saw this and it happened while Jesus was praying. While Jesus was praying. Listen, if Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father praying and everything we read of him, especially in Luke's gospel about prayer, is, is a dynamic outpouring of his constant communication and intimacy with the Father. Prayer is all over the, the gospel of Luke. And what you see happening here is that Jesus the same Christ Jesus who is seated at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us, we learn that in Romans 8.34, is the same Jesus who always lives to make intercession for us now, Hebrews 7.25, that Jesus was praying, I believe Jesus was praying, someone has got to start taking prayer seriously in this group of guys, you ask me to call to do your work because their prayer life right now means not much is going to happen when I leave this place. I believe that was the prayer of Jesus. Because if you read anything about these disciples, you knew they did one thing. They improved his prayer life. Listen, when Peter's heading up the outfit, you better be praying. And, G and Judas is stealing money out of, the out of their purse, you better be praying. I, I just simply ask you to put this down on the, on the lower shelf where we can all get to it, that Jesus was praying for these guys to get it and to begin to appropriate the power from God that was available to them if they would simply do it. And so what's that word praying? Uh, you, this word, I don't want to get too complicated. It's a, it's a Greek word, prosukamai. And guess what this word means? It means asking. It means asking with an intensity that means humbly begging and earnestly asking on behalf of not just yourself, but for someone else. You are never more like Jesus than when you are praying for someone else. Now, I met your pastor not quite a year ago when we were in Israel together and had a chance to know, become friends with about uh, 40 of the guys in North Carolina Pastor churches from all over uh, the state and from several different denominations. There were Church of God, there were Southern Baptists, there were Independent Baptists, there were Wesleyans, there were uh, United Methodists, there were, gosh, a little, you know, Church of God. It, it, it was just uh, how we all got along in that bus without killing each other, I'm not real sure. Uh, but it's amazing the, 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 the friendship and the, and the laughter that came out of that place as we just began to walk and, and, and see where Jesus walked and something very special began to, to happen as we prayed together and, and enjoyed uh, that special time together. I, I'm asking you to understand that this, this may stretch you a bit where you begin to challenge yourself to pray like Jesus. It may take you to this point. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
your prayer life will improve under many different kinds of circumstances, but I don't know that it improves any greater than when somebody has wronged you. I know that would never happen in this town or in this church, but I warn you, if you ever join another church, somebody's going to wrong you. You know, somebody's going to offend you. Somebody's going to say something that, that hurts you. And do we not live in a culture today that, that is, almost seems terminally offended? That, that, that whatever word comes out of your mouth, there's somebody's ready to, you know, just, just you know, go to war over something. And so this praying is something that they heard Jesus do. He must have been praying on behalf of them. Maybe they heard their own names mentioned. Wouldn't you like to hear your name mentioned by Jesus in prayer? You know, listen, <laughs> if I could hear Jesus praying for me, I would not fear a million enemies, but the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Now, that was 29-year-old Robert Murray McShane, a pastor that died in the 19th century. He's praying for you by name. Now, he's praying in a certain place. Now, this place is where we get the word topography from. So there was a place where they knew they would find Jesus and he'd be doing what? He'd be praying. Maybe you have that kind of place. It might have to shift around these days as we're on the road, but when I'm at home, I have a place. Uh, it's, it's a chair and, and, and it's a time of day. I'm an early riser. I, I wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I can thank my God for that, as well as my father who interceded that God would take that mantle off of him and give it to me. I kid you not. My dad always rose up early, early in the morning, and I knew I could catch him at any time of the day before 6 o'clock. He'd be up. And so I, one day I, I got real courage. This is, you know, he wasn't in great health, so I wasn't afraid of him as much. And so I, I said, you know, I, I don't think you've had a quiet time in the morning. I think you just have a sleeping disorder. I thought that was hilarious. And so he didn't say anything. But what he, he, he just kind of quietly, you know, nodded his head. And, and, um, and about, I mean, less than a week later, I am waking up at 4 a.m. every morning. Now, I've done that before. I'm not kidding you. I've done that before. But guess what? I can go back to sleep. Because at, at, at my age, I do get up occasionally at night just to check things out and, you know, just kind of make the rounds. And so um, some of you older men understand what I'm talking about. And so it's just something that I was, you know, familiar with, but, but I can go back to sleep at 4 a.m. What fool is going to stay up when they can go back down? And so I couldn't go back to sleep. I put my head on the pillow, and it's like Holy Spirit saying, hey, boy, hey, big boy, it's time for this. We're starting the day. And I talked to my dad about, you know, after about a month of that, I said, he said, how you been sleeping? I go, you never asked me that before. I said, funny you should ask. I've been waking up at 4 a.m. for the last month, and I can't go back to sleep, so I just start praying. He said, and of course he had this Columbia School of Broadcasting voice even then in his 90s, and he used to be a DJ, and he's, well, do you remember that day that you told me that I had a sleeping disorder? I said, yeah, that was really funny. And he said, well, I took that to heart, and I asked God to take this mantle off of me and give it to you. <laughs> I, I believe that. Yeah, my dad's in heaven laughing his head off. I, I'm telling you that, that there was a certain place where Jesus had and they could find him. I'm asking you, can your kids find you at prayer when panic is in the house? Or do they find you screaming at the TV? Rhetorical question, doesn't require an answer. Chew on that. And so, one of the disciples, it only takes one, be that one. And this disciple means something. This word was not invented by Jesus. The twelve didn't invent it and, and say, hey, we're, let's call ourselves the disciples. And ah, oh, let's call ourselves the twelve. No, that's not what happened. The, a disciple was someone always, as defined in this language, as someone who had a personal relationship with a teacher. That's number one. And this is also a person that yielded authority and jurisdiction to the teacher, where whatever the teacher said, that's what they did. And they were willing to face persecution for what they said they believed. And so these are the kind of disciples he had around him, and it only takes one. Are you the person today that has enough personal relationship with your teacher, Jesus Christ, that you would learn to pray from him? Are you the one that would yield to his authority and jurisdiction when he says, when you pray? Because that's the answer <laughs> when the 
statement was made, Lord, teach us to pray. Look, it, I don't know whether this fellow knew what he was saying, but what he said was, Lord, teach us to pray. He didn't teach us, say, how to pray, but Lord, teach us to pray. Now, I, I've written a book on prayer. There's a bunch of much better books than mine, but, but, but books have a way of teaching you how to pray. But only your circumstances will teach you to pray. Now, my question is this. When's your prayer life most active? When things are going well or when things are going wrong? Again, chew on that. We're not asking you to raise your hand (laughs) or vote on it, but we all know what the answer is, don't we? And if you don't, cheat off your neighbor's paper. Uh, They know. This is what we come to. Lord, teach us to pray. And I find that fascinating because when I read this, I'm reminded of a trip I was on, trying to catch a flight to Tampa, Florida, to help a church that was in a crisis. And I had to catch a flight, leaving DFW two hours late. And DFW means Dallas, Fort Worth. And so that means I'm going to miss my flight in Atlanta. Anybody that's ever been to Atlanta, no, that's, that's a real joy you know, to catch a, f- a flight there. And then I'm, I'm thinking, how am I going to get to this church? Very, very tight window here. And so I, you know, I get to the Atlanta airport, and, and I've never had this happen. Um, the gate that I need is right there. It's right next to the one that I'm just walking out of. And I, I race, you know, into the, um, into the plane. They must have warned people, hey, we're just holding here for one more passenger. Because when I, when I sat down, everybody applauded. And I thought, well, you know, my kind of crowd. And so the, the, the fella next to me um, said, well, what do you do for a living? And I, I said, well, I, you know, I just told him. I teach people, you know, I said the words, how to pray. I teach people how to pray. And he said, well, that's easy. And, you know, you always appreciate somebody who trivializes what is very important to you. And so this is not going well. And so with a more sarcasm towards him that I'm sharing with you. So, well, what would you say to him? He said, oh, easy. Tell him to get cancer. Yeah, well, the look on my face is the look of your face. And suddenly, I thought, I'm sitting next to a real nincompoop. Who would say that to somebody? And he could see my face had just dropped. And this was a couple of years before, you know, she came, you know, with the diagnosis of cancer in her life. But believe me, what he said to me next changed my perspective on how to pray versus to pray. And he said this, he said, listen, I'm I'm a good Catholic boy. I knew the words to say. I knew when to say them. I knew when to stand up. And I knew when to kneel. But until I got cancer, I never talked to Jesus face to face. I'd never forgotten that. I share that with you to just hold on to the truth of of what he may not have known what he was saying, but he was saying, Lord, teach us to pray, not how to pray. It's the difference between knowing how to diet and dieting. Yeah, I've met some nutritionists that ought to read what they write. So I, I just want you to know that this is serious business. Lord should remind you of who's in charge. He is. Teach us should remind us that this is lifelong learning in this school of prayer. And the only degree that's offered in the school of prayer is a Ph.D. You may be in kindergarten, but you can earn a Ph.D. if you would pray hard daily. That's what the school of prayer is all about. I love what William Barclay said about one of his students who uh, wasn't a great student. He said, oh, I understand uh, so-and-so is one of your students. He said, no, 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 he only attends my lectures. What did he mean by that? He wasn't a learner. You, you and I can you know an awful lot about prayer, but it doesn't really become prayer until we pray. And I love what the rabbis, uh, proverb of the rabbis of the ancient world of, of Jesus' time would say about uh, one another's students. And, and if they wanted to pay the highest compliment to a student, they would say, I see the dust of your rabbi is all over you meaning that they walk so closely to the rabbi that the dust that they stirred up on the road as they walked together was all over them. 
Should, should that not be what's said of us when we're going through a crisis? And it doesn't matter whether it's an insane crisis or a mundane crisis. It's all the same. They can bring panic out in us. And so he says, again, when you pray. Look, look at that now. He doesn't say if you pray. What does he say? When. When you pray. <laughs> Uh, the prayerful know the difference between theory and practice. Uh, th listen, there's a big difference between having frequent flyer miles on an airline and actually being a pilot of the jet. Uh, we do understand the difference, don't we? And, and there's a lot of people, and believe me, I've, I've talked to a lot of pastors over the last eight months who have had a lot of people who sit in the cheap seats giving them advice while they're trying to fly this plane through a COVID crisis. And they're either danged if they do and danged if they don't. If they don't open up fast enough, they should have been opening up faster. If they, you know, keep it close, you, you know, on and on and go, it, back and forth. I, I, I've said to more pastors these three words than I've said in my life. You know, these three, I don't know. I, I don't know what you're to do, but I know this much. I'm going to pray for you. Because there's only one person that can guide you and your church through this, and, and they're not found on Fox News. They're not found on MSNBC. They're, they're, listen, folks, quit drinking the Kool-Aid and go to the living water that Jesus has for you. Just, just understand that whatever you're watching, they're selling. They're selling ads. They, they don't, I, there may be one or two different, but I believe on the whole, they want to get paid. So you just need to understand something. You need to listen to the person who's already paid it all. And he'll guide you through this. Quit listening to every talking head and every tw twittering mouth you know, in the universe. You know, start listening to the God above who will speak to you through the person of his Holy Spirit who dwells within you. And Jesus who is seated at, at his right hand will, will take the prayers that the Holy Spirit flows from your heart to his. And he will answer your prayer. He will make sense out of the senseless. He will only do it every time. Give the Holy Spirit some elbow room in your life. And you start by talking to the Father. And the Father will take something that you are very concerned about and, and cause you to have a cherished reunion with Him in the midst of this crisis. Hallowed be thy name, we're told. It means to holy and purify and venerate and sanctify. Listen, I refuse to take advice from people who on, on the same airwave that they're giving me advice about some crisis that we're in, whether it be COVID or whether it be election, and they will use the name of God in vain with, with impunity. They, they simply spew out disrespect for the, for the name of God and for his people. I'm sorry. You know, I'm just not going to take your advice. Because if you don't show deference to, towards God, you know, I just don't understand why I need to take advice from you. So, well, well, they know a lot. If they don't know enough to trust in God, they don't know enough. Be, be discerning as you're listening for advice. How would be your name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I love what Doug Small, who was on the trip with us to Israel, he has this statement. He said, I don't pray because I'm holy. I pray because I'm not. That's me, folks. I can identify with that. And so your kingdom come means to lower your flag of rebellion <laughs> And, and just allow yourself to be a place where his kingdom comes in your heart in the midst of that crisis. I love the picture here that Alan Redpath puts it this way. Before we can pray thy kingdom come, we must be willing to pray my kingdom go. Give us this day our daily bread. That's how we're to pray. You, you can't live on yesterday's manna. Now, I will, I will confess to you, coming to North Carolina in January was a great experience. We were in 13 churches in 13 weeks. God was blessing our ministry. We're looking at each other, you know, heading down the road. Are we having fun or what? This is a beautiful state. Uh, these are great people. And all of a sudden, a, a decision came down from above, and everything shut down. I was down in White Lake. You know where White Lake is. Beautiful place, beautiful lake. And we're to preach that. We came in midnight at Saturday night to be in the church at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the word comes out from the office above, that at midnight, all churches are closed. Well, two weeks, how? <laughs> we can survive without pay for two weeks, can't we? 
surely we got enough groceries. You know, we can, yeah, we're going to make it. Eight months, a little bit different ball game. Anybody panic over the last eight months? Anybody wonder whether God's in control? Anyone ever, you know, wonder, how is this going to ever end, man? I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It, it's, <laughs> it, we get it. But the beautiful thing is we were taught to pray for our daily bread, and it's amazing. You can look at me, and, and even with a bout with cancer myself, because in June I was diagnosed with a malignant tumor in my chest, they removed this malignant tumor in my chest. They took out my thyroid. They popped into me pills that were radioactive iodine to the degree, radioactive to the degree, that I'd be isolated from here, from her and everyone else for three days in a room that I felt like the walls were closing in, man. She's left me. I know she's left me. I know she's not going to be there. But I've told her over the years, you ever leave me, I'm going with you. You know, this is something that, you know, you're going through the surgery and going through all of that you know, trauma and drama. And, and, and I will confess to you that, you know, cancer is a big deal. And please, if somebody gets cancer, you know, and they start playing detective, like, but what kind of cancer is it? What difference does it make, man? It's cancer. Well, you know, there's good cancer and there's bad cancer. I've heard some really stupid things over the last few months. I said, well. Uh, that's interesting, uh, because if it's not that big a deal, I'm going to start praying that God take this from me and give it to you, wise guy. As I said, she's the real Christian in the family. I, I just want you to know that I take this stuff seriously, but I just don't take myself very seriously. We, we pray for God to step in and do something in the chaos of, of the moment, because he's always there. He never leaves you and he never forsakes you. I've got to wrap this up. And I'll be done and you'll be glad. But I love this part. Forgive us our sins. Oh, like anybody in here needs that. But back in Texas, this works. I mean, these folks in Texas have sins. Believe me. Forgive us our sins. And, and isn't that an interesting prayer that's prayed that we can ask him for forgiveness? What's the purpose of that? Well, to forgive us our sins is, is to teach us how to let go of what we've done wrong and that what has separated us from God so that we might be reunited with Him. That's what forgive means. It means to let go. It, it, you don't hold on to it. It simply means let it go. And this is what we can pray for. Let it go. Send it away. Permit my sh shortcomings to be forgotten. Forgiving doesn't mean letting go, uh, 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 letting someone get away with something. And that's always someone's fear when they're, trapped in this thing, oh, okay, I'd like to be forgiven, I just don't want to forgive them. I know I deserve to be forgiven, but I'm not real sure about them. But within the context of this prayer, we are to learn how to pray for the forgiveness of our sins. That sets into us a movement of God's grace that empowers us to be able to unleash God's grace towards someone else who has wronged us. You're not making it up. They wronged you. You're not just a hurt feeling. They wronged you. You're not making a bigger deal out of it than was necessary. It was a big deal. All of that's true. Now, Jesus will tell you, yeah, I was there. I saw every bit of it. And you don't have to get your people around you and say, well, did you see how they hurt me? And, oh, yes, I did see that. Because, you know, it doesn't matter what's happened to you. You can always get somebody to agree with you. But the only person that's got to agree with you is Jesus. And Jesus said, yeah, I saw it. I saw every bit of it. It was as bad as you thought it was. It was worse. Because I knew what they were thinking before they did it. So, but he says, so now, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Wow, everyone? Seriously? Everyone? I'm kind of holding on to that one. Because I owe him one. And lead us not in temptation. Deliver us from evil. I was a young pastor, and this doesn't mean I'm done, but I'm, it looks like I'm done, and that's to encourage you. Okay. When I was a young pastor, it was my first pastorate, and I felt called to God to be there. I, I just, uh, I, I'd never known a, a more divine appointment than to, than to be there and to shepherd that flock. And I'm out in Arizona, and we spent four years there. I call it four years and five summers. If you've ever been to Tempe, Arizona, that area, you know what I'm talking about. And um, 
I don't know what I thought was coming my way. They'd had 16 pastors in 24 years. I think their mission statement was, next. And um, there's an old boy there that um, he ran the joint, and it didn't matter what the Constitution bylaw said, it just didn't matter. Uh, his name was George. We had church by George. And he'd been responsible for running those pastors off one after another. And uh, interesting conversation with George I had many, many times. He, at least five different times he told me that th they had missed God at the church of what they needed to do. And he could tell me, he knew the history and he knew every step along the way. He said, we miss God, boom, 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 boom. And he would just describe it to me. And it's painful to hear. But he told over and over and over again. And every one of this, yeah, the pastor wanted to lead us to this, but we just wouldn't agree to it. And I said, George, you see any common denominator here? And um, this is a brilliant guy. He'd been a tank commander with Patton, and he you know, was a major factor over at Arizona State University, earned Ph.D., brilliant engineer. But uh, sometimes you just can't see the forest for the trees. And so, um, so it was on um, when he wanted us to try to build some massive facility that I said, you know, we, just, we don't have the support here to, to do this. It's going to bankrupt the church if we start down this road. And I offered another solution, and I became his, I became his arch enemy. Well, it went on for a couple years, and he had his means of making sure enough money was withdrawn from giving to just you know, turn things into a really, really squeaking wheel. And if you've ever been a part of something like that, you know it, it's a spirit. Uh, that begins to take hold of the church. It's very painful for people as well as a pastor to endure. And um, and we had one of these knockdown dragouts, three hour meetings after church on Sunday night. And the church was split down the middle, literally 51 to 49 percent. We had split church over the approval of a budget that would cut the salaries of the staff by about 15 percent. And um, we weren't going to fire anybody because they, they made me sure that as they presented this, they, 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 everybody knew how much they loved the pastor. Everybody knew how much they loved the pastor. It grieves us to have to do I mean, it, went on, it was just pontificating. So, you know, I'm presiding over this, and, and I had to stop occasionally just to, <laughs> because it just was nauseating. Dana and I leave, uh, go back home. A couple days later, the Lord gave me a sense of direction about what to do. Should, should, we, should we leave the church? You know, just step away. Just Sometimes the chaos is just too much. And God gave me a word to stay and, and to go without a salary for a year. To withdraw from them the responsibility to pay me, and I'd continue to carry on ministry for the coming year. That way, another staff would have to have their salaries cut. You know, ministries would have to be you know, cut short. And we could carry on. And that Sunday morning, I announced to the people that uh, God's given me a solution for our dilemma that I hope pleases you and shared that with them. And, um, and it was standing ovation. There were about 400 people just standing. And I, mean, it was, and I looked about to the door, through this door down the right, that where those exit doors are, and I could see George and the finance committee chairman, and they were screaming at each other because their plan had gone wrong. And that year, God stepped in in a way I had never seen God you know, move. People getting saved. Uh, things happening that you just, you know, I don't have time to share with you. But, um, but seriously, we sold our homes, sold cars, got down to a, a minimal you know, expenses as, as we could possibly could. And, um, and one night, I'm, I'm putting my little ones to bed. And uh, instead of them being in separate rooms, now they're in one room. Uh, we got bunk beds, and I had to clip a fan you know, on their little bunk beds, because uh, we couldn't afford to run the air conditioning. Uh, it's already 120 degrees in May, and and now I'm, I'm putting to sleep at night with a little washcloth and singing to them and praying over them. And uh, to this day, they remember that as one of the greatest experiences of their lives. And and for me, it was not, because my, my heart was hurting uh, for my little ones. And and I wish I could tell you that I handled that real well, but I but I... I walked out of that room, and I, I looked into heaven, and I, I said some things to God about that man that I can't repeat to you. And here's what I heard as I share with you. Forgive him. Somebody else needs to do that. <laughs> I, mean, 
I, I'm, and I, 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 I did. And I, will, I would like to tell you that, man, it just smoothed everything over. This went on for 15 years. One day I'm in a van in Boston, Massachusetts, and we're wrapping up an assignment uh, for the, what we, the NAM, North American Mission Board. I was helping put together an evangelism strategy, and I heard a voice in the back of the van. It's like 4 a.m. in the morning. It's before God gave me the grace to get up early and talk to him, and I'm just drink, drinking coffee and want to be left alone, and, and someone calls my name you know, from the back of the van. He says, Gary, that's you. And I said, yeah, Gary Miller. And he said, uh, Hey, this is Nathan uh, Pillow. We're I'm from. Uh, uh, you remember me from Arizona? He'd been the evangelism director. I said, Yeah, I sure do. Remember you, Nathan? We're good to hear your voice. He said, We miss you out in Arizona. I said, Well, I wish I could say I missed it. And uh, you know, because some rodeos, you know, you don't need to go back to. And um, you know, there's no lesson to be learned from the second kick of a mule. So I, I didn't want to <laughs> reminisce about that. So. And so he said. Um, he said, you know, you had a rough ride there. I said, yes, yeah, quite a rodeo. And he's a Texas boy, and he said, well, you rode it the whole eight seconds. And that means that uh, you rode it to the buzzer. And I said, well, okay, I appreciate hearing that. Well, come back, see us any time. I said, well, I'd love to do that someday. I think I meant it. And, uh, and he said, well, you know George died. I'm sorry to hear that. He got down to less than 50 pounds, died a terrible death. And... Um, and I said, well, I, I hate to hear it. And that was our conversation. Sun's coming up over Boston Harbor as we drive by. And, and it was the dawn of a new day. And suddenly the Holy Spirit just gave me a, 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 a tenderness in my spirit to understand what I had just heard. And here's what I've heard. It's over. It's over. Because when I heard that man's voice on any other occasion up to that point, if I heard that man's name on any occasion up to that point, I would just recoil in my spirit. That morning at 4 a.m. with no warning, I hear his voice mentioned, I hear his death announced. I had no, I had no anger, I had nothing but compassion, and it was genuine. Where did that come from? That comes from forgiveness. That comes from the forgiveness that you were willing to apply at the moment when grace is needed the most in your life. What you're doing when you forgive somebody is you stop trying to poison yourself and hoping they'll die. When you forgive them, you are applying the grace of God to your broken heart. And it's amazing what God can do with a broken heart if you'll give Him all the pieces. And so if you apply that kind of grace, what's going to happen is you're going to let loose a flow of God's grace into someone else's life, but most importantly, it'll flow into yours. You will not know when it arrives because you don't hear do arrive slamming into the ground. You don't hear do like that. You don't hear snow like that, but do think of that. You, this is what grace does. It takes the hardness of your heart when you forgive someone and it begins to saturate you with the dew of heaven as you allow the person of the Holy Spirit to take that broken heart and allow the grace of God to fill you until it pours through every fiber of your being and every part of your hurt and your pain and it has flow out to touch the hearts and lives of someone that you have a tough time even saying their name but you can forgive them in the power of Jesus Christ and it may not transform them but it will transform you I promise you on the authority of the word of God this will happen for you do you believe that today I don't know who it is I don't know what's happened but God knows and it was real you're not making it up and you're not making a bigger deal out of it than it was but he, he's ready to help you with this. May it take a while for that grace to soften a hardened heart over a very difficult situation. But he can do it. I beg of you to allow God's grace of forgiveness to teach you this much. That when you let go of something towards someone, you're not letting them get away with anything. You're just letting go of what it does to you. And you're placing that into God's hands to make sense out of the senseless and to give hope in the middle of hopelessness. I ask you to do that today.
in the name of Jesus. Well, it's Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to have two pastors stand right here, and we're going to appreciate them. We're going to go to God on their behalf in prayer. Now, if there aren't any other pastors in the room, I need for you two guys to get right here, okay? This is called Come to Jesus. And Dana, you get on. Gina, you come up here too. Yes, please, please. Y'all stand together. Okay. I know it's COVID world. I'm not sure how free you folks are here, but, but I know in most you know, Baptist churches, it's always a challenge when you start having people lay hands on folks. So, uh, but can you do this? Can I kind of place your hands? There you go. Let's stand, okay? And here's what I ask you to do. I heard Governor Huckley make this statement a, not too long ago, but long enough that I wish I could claim it for myself, but I still remember he said it. Um, you know, pray for your pastor. He needs it, and you need the practice. Isn't that a great statement? And so this morning, here's what I want to do. I want us to pray over them loud enough for them to hear you. Now, God will hear you in heaven if you're whispering, but sometimes it helps people to hear your voices lifting them up in prayer. So I'm going to count to three, okay? And then I'm going to ask you to just kind of place your hands before them like this. And, and just as you're sending that prayer to them, we know it heads to heaven. But count to three with me, and then we're going to pray over them. Aloud, okay? Aloud. Now, if you're watching your football team play yesterday, you probably said some things out loud. Maybe God didn't need to hear. But, but this morning, we're going to pray over them loud enough for God to hear something that he'd love to hear. Are you ready to do this yet? Okay. I haven't talked you into anything you don't want to do. Here we go. One, two, three, pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for the prayers of your people today. Thank you for these faithful pastors. Thank you for their loving wives. Thank you, Father, for helpmates that you've given to them that they do not deserve, but they love. And I thank you, Father, that you are doing something in their lives that only you can get credit for. We ask you to put your handprints all over this, these two church fellowships, molding them into one body until, Father, this entire community, this city, and the surrounding county would know that, that Jesus is at work here through your people. And we ask you, Father, to do this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. In Texas, we say, let's eat, but I'll, I'll go with amen. We're great. Ooh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Hiro, for sharing your wonderful testimony and, and what God's doing in the life of your ministry. And we pray for you and glory in your family. Thank you, Gary and Dana, for being here. And, and Gary, for your wonderful uh, word. And Dana, for putting up with Gary. Um, but, but we are blessed. And, you know, it's what a great reminder that, you know what, um, we're called to be better. We're called to be bigger. And our God is better and bigger than anything this world has. And we as Christians, especially now, need to shine that so that people can see God. Can, that, that people can um, look at us and say, you know, there's something different about them because they know Jesus. And that's what we need to be as Christians, especially now. Um, I just want to invite you, as God's leading you, um, to pray. Feel free to pray. This altar is open. We're here to pray for you. We got our staff, Pastor Mike, um, Pastor Allen's here, Gary, Pastor Hiro, myself. We'll be happy to pray with you if you have any prayer needs. Um, just let God's Spirit lead you as, as He is leading you. And if you need to pray, pray. Um, if you need one of us to help you, we'll be happy to help you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, we would love to sit and talk with you about how you can give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. No greater day than today to get your life right with the Lord. So as we sing our song of invitation, we invite you to respond as God is leading you. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, learn through the fiercest Eyes of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when shy 
ebbing seas, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, to look on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love. Righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of you to come. Uh, Gary will be up here. Pastor Hiro and Gloria are here. Um, if you want to go and um, talk to Dana um, out there by the library, you can talk with them. They have copies of their wonderful book, Talk Less, Pray More. But uh, we we'll invite you all to come. As you are dismissed, come by and just show your love and appreciation to them and thank them for their ministry to us today. And we'll invite Pastor Mike to close us in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day and are grateful to you, God, for this opportunity that we've uh, been, been given today to meet in your presence and to hear your word proclaimed boldly and truthfully. God, we thank you for that. God, it does challenge us each and every day to, um, to pray and not just to know about prayer. And I just pray you'll help us uh, that we might ask the, that question, Lord, teach us to pray. Um, and God as well, we just ask that um, you would help us today if there's someone who has wronged us, uh, whether that's something deeply or if that's something minor. God, I just pray that you will help us as we forgive uh, that other person because God, it, as uh, our pastor shared with us this morning, it's like drinking poison and hoping that it will kill the other person. And God, we need to release um, your grace in the life of ourself as well as those uh, that have done us wrong. And so I just pray, God, that you will give us the wisdom and the insight that we need uh, as we uh, practice uh, how to pray each and every day. And so thank you for each one that's here. We pray a blessing upon them. And I just pray, God, as we go through this week, all that's said and done will bring honor to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.